So the research paper by Kruger and Muller is just incredible. We are, for the first time ever in the United States, facing not only high unemployment, but high levels of long-term unemployment. People unemployed now six, nine, 12 months. And the question is, are those people going to be able to, to be reintegrated back into the workforce? Are the long-term unemployed different than the short-term unemployed? Well, in order to learn about this, the authors went out and actually ran surveys of thousands of short and long-term unemployed people. They didn't just run one survey, they went back to these people every week. They asked them how much they'd searched for work over the preceding week. They asked them what, how much they'd searched for work yesterday. They asked them how they felt about this as well. You get a very stark picture. The long-term unemployed are, the longer someone is unemployed, the less likely they are to so search for work. The more miserable they find searching for work, the more miserable they find the rest of their lives. And this is true, through, true throughout the, the duration of their unemployment. So even once unemployment insurance runs out, uh, you don't see any of these behaviours change. Um, so less job search, less effective job search, and greater misery among the long-term unemployed, which really is a huge cause, cause for concern when we think about the recovery going forward. Are these folks going to be in a position that they can get out there, get active, and find the jobs once they start getting created? It's a beautiful model for economic research. You take a first order question, are households out there able to cope with the financial shocks that are hitting them? And you go out there and you just gather new data. And this is what the authors did. And they went out and they said uh, to US households, uh, what if you had to come up with $2,000 within the next month? Think about that as sort of a, the cost of a shot transmission on your car. The amazing thing is that just about a half of US households said they couldn't come up with the money. The authors repeated the same question, actually, in several different countries around the world. Uh, the Canadians, much more likely to. Uh, maybe a quarter of those had difficulty coming up with $2,000 within a month. Um, and they've got a whole bunch of other countries. It's very difficult to figure out exactly which countries, uh, to figure out which countries are going to be more and less fragile. But it's absolutely clear that the, that the United States, US families, are incredibly fragile. And this is a problem that is not just a, one of the poor. Uh, you look at, in the data, at what looks like middle class families, and it looks like middle class families. If they get hit with an unexpected shock, you can imagine your roof falling in or something like that, they're really not in a position to deal effectively with it at all. The German unemployment miracle is, well, it's incredible. Germany had a recession just like the United States did. In fact, if you look at GDP statistics, it had a worse recession. But then go and have a look at the unemployment rate. Of course, we, what we saw in the United States is unemployment has doubled. In Germany, it barely rose. In fact, uh, employment growth, in, employment today is at about the same level it was pre-recession. So the question is why? The authors think that about a third of this might be because, might be actually something less miraculous. That the German manufacturers were actually just a, not so excited by the boom. And so hiring in Germany hadn't been so strong leading up to the boom, which means that firing when the boom ends doesn't have to be so strong either. A lot of people talked about wage moderation. There's been a lot of labor market reform in Germany. The authors think maybe that's a tenth of the story, but really there's not been that much wage moderation. The really important and interesting thing that's happened in Germany is that while hours worked in the economy have fallen quite substantially, the number of people employed hasn't. What's happened is the average number of hours worked has declined, allowing everyone to keep their jobs. Figuring out exactly what's going on there is somewhat difficult. So Germany's quite famous for having a, a work sharing system. And there's a lot of discussion about work sharing potentially in the United States as well. So that way, instead of cutting off one in every 10 of your workers, you say to all 10 of them, reduce your hours by one tenth. The other thing that's happened in, in Germany is uh, the use of overtime accounts. So what would happen is that you could uh, ask your workers to work harder during the boom and they would build up a balance in their overtime accounts. You're not paying them overtime, you're just building up a balance of extra hours that they've worked. Then when the recession hits, you just run down that balance. You say, well, you know what, I already owed you a few hundred hours. For the next few weeks, just come in, you know, 10 hours fewer. And so that then made it a lot easier for the Germans to cut the number of hours for each worker rather than cutting the number of workers. And that's what kept, has kept employment levels high despite the fact that the macroeconomic shock there has been just about as large. So for a monetary economist, it feels like we live in extraordinary times. The, the Fed now can't move interest rates any lower. So it's, it's QE2, quantitative easing. 
And what they're trying to do by that is not move the short-term interest rate, but move the longer-term interest rates uh, on, on five and ten-year bonds downwards. Feels like brave times, we've never tried this before. Turns out, it's a little known historic fact, we tried this actually back in 1960. President Kennedy, a lot like President Obama, was elected during a recession, inherited a recession. President Kennedy at the time didn't want to try, didn't want to try and use monetary stimulus, reduce the normal short-term interest rate, because he's worried about the balance of payments. So instead what they tried was something that became known as Operation Twist, named for the dance craze of the time. And Operation Twist was a, an attempt to reduce long-term interest rates instead of short-term interest rates, which is what the Fed normally does. In fact, if you look at Operation Twist, Eric Swanson shows, it's remarkably similar to what we call today QE2. And so he's able to go back through, given this remarkable historic episode and given the, the amazing similarities, and say, uh, well, given what happened in Operation Twist, what, what do we think is going to happen as a result of QE2? And his estimates suggest that Operation Twist succeeded in reducing long-term interest rates by maybe 15 basis points. That's one-sixth of a, a percentage point. That sounds pretty small. But remember, that's the effect on, on long-term interest rates. When used to thinking about changes in short-term interest rates, reducing a long-term interest rate by about one-sixth of a percentage point is actually what would normally happen if the Fed reduced short-term interest rates by a full percentage point. So he suggests that Operation Twist had an effect that was roughly similar to what you would ex expect if the Fed reduced interest rates by 100 basis points or equivalently one percentage point. So that suggests maybe we should be optimistic that QE2 is actually going to do something. Now QE2 is actually part of uh, another paper in this uh, conference. Uh, Greg, Greg Mankiw and Matt Wurnzel look and they say, when is it that we should be relying on fiscal policy? When should we be relying on monetary policy? Their ideas, what, the, what they do is they decide that macroeconomists so often write down complicated models and we lose track of what's going on. So they write down the simplest mathematical representation of the economy they can. And they come up with some, at first, fairly obvious insights, but you can see where they come from. The first insight is that most of the time we should rely on monetary rather than fiscal policy. The logic here is that uh, fiscal policy is good at getting us back to the level of GDP we want, but it changes the composition of GDP. If we use fiscal policy, we end up with more roads and parks, whereas if we use monetary policy, we each just do a little bit more spending. So most of the time, use monetary policy. If we can't use monetary policy, then something like QE2 makes a lot of sense. And if we eventually run out of ammo with QE2, that's the point at which they say we should think about fiscal stimulus. But if we're going to do fiscal stimulus, they say uh, we should do this with investment credits instead of, uh, instead of building more roads and parks. 